Good morning, everybody. It is an honor and privilege to speak before you in St. Bartholomew's Church. And let me ask you that we repeat the mantra of the universe in its purity, Om Nam, seven times together. Om Nam Om Nam Om Nam When we chant, our thinking is gone or recedes enough that we would experience some one mind together. This oneness is what we strive for, and it is the source of many qualities that we strive to achieve. Most of you have had interviews this morning, and most of you were asked this question, what is this? This is a very simple object. So attaining the true nature of the Zen stick is actually not difficult, and all of you got that. When it came to the bell, it was another matter. And attaining the true nature of the bell was also very simple. But the moment we tried to relate the two to each other, it became another question. Same or different? So bell and stick, without thinking, how can you answer this question same or different? How can you not be hooked by, own, by your own dualistic mind? Because eventually, we all get it, okay? Same or different is our idea. And it's very easy to get it in terms of the stick and the bell. But when I say, this human being and that human being, are they the same or different? Then it becomes crucial. Our dualistic mind is a very interesting tool. It made us human, it made us conscious, but it also got us out of the Garden of Eden. It's the same tool, the same instrument that says I and you and same and different, and good, and bad. So we lost this oneness, which was part of our life before we became conscious as human beings. So it looks like that with our consciousness and this distinct sense of I comes the duality that we do not wish, or not many times. So if we do not calibrate this engine of duality inside our minds, we can reap a lot of suffering and cause a lot of suffering. If you cannot distinguish between clean and dirty, we live a very unhealthy life. Either way, some people are attached to this perfectionist, spotless cleanliness, the precision maniacs, and it's almost impossible to live with them. The other, they don't do laundry so many times a week. They don't care how they smell, they don't care how they look, they are really on the dirty side, the soiled side. And that is also a problem. So it means that this engine of distinguishing, this duality, is not really working for them. They don't care about themselves or the environment. So we say it's underperforming. Because when you teach a child or a house-trained animal, a pet, they have to distinguish between clean 
and dirty. This is very important. We learn that. Then we truly experience our own karma, become an independent person, and through that we start to relate to one another. And we make a lot of mistakes. We think in terms of same or different, better or worse, higher or lower. And when it goes into super overdrive, then it becomes judgment. It becomes discrimination. It becomes apartheid. It becomes racism. Then this distinguishing engine, as it overperforms and overfunctions, creates a lot of damage. So, underfunction, underperforming, problem. Overperforming, also a problem. How do you keep this mind in the middle way? How do you truly attain the true job of mankind on this earth? Because it looks like that we cannot really live without this notion of the self, the notion of us, the notion of them, or you, or we. It's not a linguistic problem. Even if we stop talking, we don't stop thinking. Silent retreats are very good, but even though you keep silence outside, if you don't do the right practice inside, your engine is still running. It perpetuates the narrative. It reconstitutes the ego. So ever since we became conscious of the self, we started to ask questions about it. Where does it come from? Did something, someone create that for us? Is it our destiny to have this kind of personality? Can we change that somehow? Can we find its origin? So for the last few thousand years, the human evolution centered around this. Who we are, what we are doing, can we change our path, or we are just cast iron in the cold. In the Orient, there were three very important figures besides many others. Buddha Shakyamuni, Lao Tse, and Confucius. Their work still defines Oriental society, even though the last 150 years brought about a lot of radical changes. In the West, the Abrahamite religions with Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and of course later, St. Francis of Assisi, other great saints, they defined our thought. If you put the two systems side by side, you can notice some striking differences in the terms how they operate and what kind of self-image they create for men. What is interesting that when you practice Zen, you do not depend on any of this. It does not matter whether you are in the oriental setting and you practice it in Asia, or you practice the simple, clear mind here in the West in a wonderful church. No wonder that the last three talks I've had the chance to give were all in churches. Whether it was the United Universalist Church, whether it was the Church of St. Francis of Assisi, or here, the St. Bartholomew, it signifies a very clear change. We want something deeper. We want something new. We want to refresh the notion of who we are and what this world is. Because we are eager to find our job. What it means that we are born, we live this very short life of 70, 80, maybe 90 years on this planet, then we're gone. And just like Zen does not depend on Western or Eastern context, we should not really depend on any notions what we were before we were born and what we will be after we die. In Zen we say, if this moment is clear, everything is clear. If this moment is not clear, nothing is clear. Remember the Diamond Sutra where it says, the mind which is divided into past, present and future cannot attain awakening. So if your mind is divided into lives before this one, lives after this one, then you cannot live this current life correctly. So there's enough perspective in this life. There's enough teaching of cause and effect about this person looking at me. 
that you would find the correct compass for your practice and your life with all beings. That's why in Zen we put so much emphasis on this moment. It is not cutting off the mind of the past, present, and future. It's transcending it. It's very different. When you take off with an aircraft, you do not forget about ground transportation. You just go beyond it. You know your shuttle bus is waiting for you down there at the terminal when you arrive. But you don't use it when you want to get from coast to coast. Likewise, when you want to attain your true nature, you do not use dualistic thinking because it's not suitable for that. When you return before thinking and attain the mind of not knowing, not thinking, then your substance, your substance, your substance, all being substance, my substance, become the same. So without thinking, we are already complete. And this is what the Desert Fathers had as their wisdom in Anatolia a couple of centuries after Jesus' time. This is the wisdom that Tang Dynasty China imparted upon us in various forms of Kongan collections in Korea and Japan and China. And this is the intuitive wisdom that many artists, they just put into an artwork, some form of creation. And if you hear it, see it, touch it, look at it, you get this, <gasps> that the Greeks called taumazain, to wonder, to be completely without any notion of self, to be just one with that work of art or this moment of meditation or the mysterious experience of God. Frankly, to change our human karma as we are with 7.8 billion on this planet and counting, there is no other chance. That several ways are available. We can choose several styles and religions, Oriental, Western, etc. But if we don't do something, then our karma will overtake us. Cause and effect will be stronger than our potential to create and recreate life on Earth. And that the consequences will be very severe. They are already showing in terms of environmental, human, material, political, military, ecological, economic consequences. But how do we rise to the challenge of recreating our way of life on Earth? Without this point, without oneness, without clarity, we cannot do that. We are attached to name and form. We are attached to karma. We are attached to our idea of ourselves and that of the others. Then we are landlocked into our own habits, into our own views. And to the extent that these views are clear, our minds function correctly, recognize the situation correctly, establishes relationships correctly and functions well. How do we know that this function is correct? Not because it follows some scripture or idea, but because it creates no suffering or minimal suffering. And it creates a lot of happiness, loving kindness, compassion, wisdom, selfless help, and benefit to all beings. This is not wishful thinking. This is our potential as human beings. We can do that. But if we don't do the work inside, we cannot do the work outside. That's the message of those practitioners who seemingly just sat for years, either in a cave or in a monastery, on a mountaintop, and they sent a different message than usual. What is our path? Where do we go from here? What kind of choices do we make? All these questions depend on one factor, how clear our mind is. And it's wonderful that in this space, with this practice, that we have the chance to share this morning together. It's a path going that way, going to this clarity, which is like a mirror, which is clear like space, and it functions flawlessly moment to moment. I think this is plenty for introductory, mm -hmm. and if you have any questions, which I hope you do, I'll try and answer them.
you mentioned something about group karma, and you know, w most of us are privileged here, I think, maybe, privileged to have been born in the United States where we don't have challenges that other countries do and other places do. And I wanted to know what you thought of that. Well, group karma is very interesting because mostly we talk about family and individual, and of course couples karma, but the fourth is group karma. And I encourage everybody to ask this question, what brought me here? What made you born in the United States of America and not, let's say, in South Africa or Australia? They all speak English, by the way. But somehow you were not born there. So if you see the commonality, which is really not limited to national identity, choice of food, language, choice of clothing, choice of arts and religion. It's all part of it, but it's not limited to that. Some kind of psychological traits, some kind of deep karma brought us here because we have to face it. And group karma means that you face that karma in everyone including yourself. And that's why it's important to leave the group from time to time, look at it from an external perspective, and then return to the group with this newfound clarity, which would be impossible to get within the group. Let me give you an example. First a metaphor, then something real. If everybody is wearing yellow glasses, after a while nobody knows that the world is yellow, because it's pre-agreed. It's something we can all assume because everybody is wearing yellow glasses. So for these folks, the whole world is yellow. Those who are born in the US, they look at the world necessarily from an American perspective until you take a long journey and you reside maybe outside of the US. And then you look at your country from an external point of view and that point, that location, makes you change. Because you don't drive, you don't talk, you don't eat, you don't speak in the way you used to in your own country. When I went to South Korea in 1994, during those six years that I stayed there continuously and did not visit back to Europe, made me very aware why I was born in Hungary, why I was born in Europe, what kind of karma do I have to face? Why was I necessarily born to the parents and the locale? And if you look at it, you see your own job, you see your own part. And mind you, this is not a guilt trip. You're not guilty of anything. But you brought your homework in your backpack when you were born. That's your subconscious. And as you open up as a person, these contents from your subconscious, they appear. So the content of your own mind and the location and time and human environment where you are born, they belong together. And that's why I said at the beginning of this answer, what is it that brought you here? What was it in your own backpack that made you land at this station? Zen operates with questions. So I will not tell you any answers to your questions. We provide a way that you find them yourself and then use that wisdom and compassion to help others find their way. If you process this karma, you will still be American, but you will be a different American from those who have not processed it, still attached to it, have dualistic views about it, make a big deal or a small thing about it, love it or hate it. This processed karma, when you have seen it, earned it, owned it, means that all these dualistic views are peeled off. You see karma as it is, without any judgment, without any labels. You see how cause and effect operates in you as you drive on Interstate 95. Have you seen that, how you operate when five lanes are streaming in the same direction, express lanes on your left? Wow! How you operate and interact together with other motorists on the highway. Some people love it. They see it as a stream of consciousness divided into small trucks and cars 
And so people have road rage. What's, what is making the difference? What kind of mind is reacting in one way or another? See that. And if you continue with this insight, then you will attain what it means to be born here. What kind of freedoms and responsibilities that makes you have. And then we can truly walk on the path and help others with this. More questions? What can you say about the influence of the spirits and karma of our ancestors in our lives? It's very important. Now, from group karma, we switch to family karma. So the question goes in the same way, but it penetrates to a different depth. Why you were born to that family? So you have very clear archetypes within yourself. The maternal, the paternal. You see why your parents gave you that education, that child rearing that made you the person largely into who you are. You can see your internal father and mother inside. What kind of karma is it in your backpack that brought you to your parents? And people ask me about predetermined karma, I always say, you made that. You put that into your backpack. And that made you land where you were born. You were not born to the neighbors. You were born to your parents. It's a huge difference whether it's Finnegan's Lane 99 or 56. They are in the same street, but not the same house. Not the same parents. Not the same life. One goes to college, the other becomes a bus person. What determines that? That's your previous karma in your own mind, bringing you to your parents. So see what kind of homework your parents give you. What kind of potential they activate in you. Because let me tell you a trade secret. There is no inheritance in terms of one ego transfusing itself to another. Like parents have this wish, this dream, that their children would be just the way they like them, just the way they want them to live their lives as a continuation of my values, my ideas. In that sense, children do not inherit anything, but because of their close karma with their parents, they are born to them, they're getting educated by them, and also they re-educate the parents too. They teach back. So this child rearing, when this information, this impulse, this willpower, all the emotions and thoughts, they go back and forth. It's very close, it's very intimate. Sometimes it's painfully intimate, sometimes it's wonderfully intimate. And that's what makes us feel that one personality actually goes into the other. So one ego transmits itself to the other. That's not true. It's just a lot of giving and taking, changing one and the other. But each and every one of us has our own karma in our own backpack, connected to our family, to our spouse, to our group. So ask this question deeply, what brought me to my parents? And if you see that inside, you can earn it, you can own it, and then you can do something creative with it. If not, we just seem to be the victim of circumstances. If you have insight, if you have clarity, your life becomes a series of decisions. This defines your path. If not, you have no insight, you believe you have some destiny, some fate. No, you just didn't see the sign around the corner. That's all. So it's dependent on our own mind how we live our lives. That's a given. Everybody here knows that. But how your fate turns into the path, how your destiny turns into a series of choices, that's our job to discover, moment to moment, how we do that. More questions? Any kind? When it comes to the higher power, how do you think about that? We bow to the higher power. We, there is a higher power. Yeah, it's better to bow and not to break. How do I understand all the horrors that are going on in the world today. If there's a higher power, is he responsible? Is that per he? See, I say he. Okay, let me ask you another question. That higher power, is it inside of you or outside of you? I don't know. 
keep this don't know, then the inside power and the outside power, they become one. And then you will not externalize anything that you don't have to. Also, you will not internalize anything that you should not. These horrors of the world, also the good things in the world, they are all created by mind alone, all created by our own actions, speech, thoughts, and emotions. What is it that perceives and governs all these channels that I have mentioned? Now, that higher power we have to find. In our line of work, in our tradition, we call this Buddha nature. Originally, doesn't come, doesn't go. It's not born, doesn't die. It is present in all phenomena, in all beings. Originally, it has no name and no form. It is neither inside nor outside. But that's exactly what sees and creates everything. We bow to it because we all have it. Our teachers, our great patriarchs, they realized it to the fullest possible extent. We call that unexcelled enlightenment. That was their attainment. That's why we bow to them as a person, as a realized being, as those who completely manifested this higher power, which is neither inside nor outside. We can find that. And for that, we have to look inside of ourselves. But once you found it, you see that it's in everyone. It's everywhere. That's what Buddha Shakyamuni realized. And oh, everybody's potentially Buddha. All beings have Buddha nature. They just don't know it. They just didn't realize it. So when you bow to the higher one, then your own self gets lower and lower and lower. Our notion of self will never completely disappear, but it can become infinitesimally small. And that's wonderful because we don't put ourselves into this illusory, huge, egotistical spot because it's dangerous for ourselves and for the world as well. Keep that don't know. You answered wonderfully. And when this don't know becomes strong and clear, this higher power begins to function without thinking, without proclamations, without any labels. I see a lot of people in the world today, they're not responsible. You know, their brain is just not right, you know. I don't know. Surgery? Necessary? How do we make the brain right? They're born that way. Some of them oh. just born this way, you know, that... How do things like... How, how do you understand that? If people are not responsible, you should teach them freedom, because that's what they want. What they don't understand is that freedom and responsibility are the two sides of the same coin. If they're not interested in being an adult, then you should teach them as you would teach children. If they don't want to take responsibility, teach them freedom. That's what they want. So that's what they will get, but they don't know what it is yet. So what is freedom? This country was built on that. And it's one of the tightest systems in terms of social norms, unwritten rules, precedent-based law, etc. So where is freedom? In this if you don't find that inside, it will never appear outside. So freedom and responsibility. Eventually, when you teach one, you will get the other. Let's say you get a dog. It's your dog. You take care of the dog. Walk her, feed her, clean her, take her to Petco, etc. And then you realize that your dog obeys only you. If you trained her right, obeys only you. You became the master of the dog. You have freedom over the dog because you took responsibility. Thank They're you. saying in this country today we have more suicides yes. than any other time in history. Yes, that's true about Korea and Hungary too, yeah. Lithuania too. So how, how do we just... How does that happen? Medit People lose hope and lose perspective. Most, uh, like 90% of these very sad cases we're just wanting attention and love and kindness, some kind of human relationship. They actually didn't want to die, but they used a very strong signal to warn their environment. Only a fraction of them really want to die. I talked with a few of these. And when they realize 
that they should not punish the body for the mind's problems, they shouldn't cut the connection when there's a problem to solve, then they gain a new perspective. It's very important to care for them, to help them, to counsel them, and make cause and effect clear, like if they are cutting the cord right now, they take the unresolved problem with their own backpack to their next life, including the habit of suicide. So they're making their job a lot worse. Now you may ask, what if they don't believe in reincarnation? Then just the environment can teach them. So they want to avoid suffering, but do they have the right to make their environment suffer with that loss, with that tragedy? Once, with this uh, person who was really serious, absolutely, totally serious, and there was no way to talk him out of it. Desperate, depressed, hateful, bitter, wanted to end everything. Whatever I said, I said, whatever I hear from you is just making me suffer more because I have to think about it. I would have to change myself. So I want to end it once and for all. And he wasn't paying attention to cause and effect, just the immediate relief of his pain. And I said, okay. You want to do it? No one will talk you out of it. Neither me, nor God, nor your counselor, therapist. You will do it. But first, please do something just for me. Say goodbye to everybody in your vicinity. Say goodbye to your friends, to your enemies. And also say goodbye to me when you are all done with everyone else. The guy is still alive today. So, use every possible avenue to prevent a premature that has no meaning, that has no function. So the terminally ill that are using uh, euthanasia, it's a very different genre. It's not somebody young or middle-aged wanting to end his life or her life because of problems. The samurai who commit seppuku because their daimyo lost the war and ritually they have to end their lives. That's also a very different ballgame. Don't be afraid of death. If we are, we cannot help others avoid suicidal tendencies. We should see the function of death, which is very natural. If we were not impermanent, there would be even more people on this planet and we couldn't really go to the next stage if our lives were infinite. That would be a total disaster. So coming and going is natural. Living and dying is natural. Premature, unreasonable, incorrect death, that's not necessary. Okay? Thank you for being here. I'm a little confused on the idea of choice in dualism. I don't understand how choice, having choice doesn't create scenario of the dualism you were talking about? Dualism is neither good nor bad. Like, you made a choice to create a special blend of tea for today, which I truly appreciate. You created something really pleasant, colorful, with good scent. It's super heavy dualism, because it distinguishes that tea from every other blend. That's great. We call that the non-harmful choice. So make those choices because we live in a world of swirling dualities with multiple interactions, okay? And we should use dualities in the right way. Let me answer your question in depth with the Zen circle. The Zen circle in our teaching has five points. Zero is when we have no questions, only put the blame to someone else. We are fine, the world is wrong. We don't know why we are here, but we want everything because it's our birthright. So it's zero degrees, the usual ego, the usual crust of ignorance. Mm -hmm. Then something breaks that and we are at one degree because we suddenly ask the right question. Suddenly a moment of sincerity appeared and we start to study. We begin to understand a little bit what this is, what's going on inside and outside. When this understanding has reached a tipping point, it's called 90 degrees. The tipping point is that from that 
onwards, you have to walk the walk and stop the talk. You would have to experience it and attain it and not think about it anymore. No matter how much you study water as H2O, if you don't drink it, you don't get it. Same thing with spirituality. You can do shopping in your spiritual shopping mall, <laughs> but if you found the right item and you, you don't take it home and you don't start to practice, you've done just shopping. 180 on the Zen circle is this. You attain. You started the experience, the path itself at night, and it turns and you practice and you practice and you practice and boom, you attain. Whatever you call it, hmm. God, Buddha, higher power, whatever you call it, suddenly it becomes reality for you and then all the names and forms are gone. Hmm. They become optional, they become labels, they become just creations. Mm -hmm. And then with this substantial experience, you start to change. You start to transform your karma, and that's when true freedom and responsibility together, they start to function. When this transformation is complete for yourself, it's 270 degrees, you've changed substantially. And then you can go on, and you can start to have a positive effect on your environment without persuading them, converting them, pushing them one way or another. And then at 360 degrees, your specialty, yourself, totally disappears. And you just stay as a bodhisattva, sometimes in disguise, sometimes in working clothes, that is living his or her life and helping all beings become free from suffering. Somebody is hungry, give that person food. Somebody is thirsty, give that person drink. That's 360 degrees and the correct function of dualistic qualities, mm -hmm. which we need. But if we don't use them correctly, if we identify with them, then we are controlled by them. That's when we feel that we have no choice. We always have a choice. Was your mind wider and more spacious than your karma? Did it have more space than the objects piled up in it? And that's why we need to practice that we do not kind of stress ourselves to death because we have to make a tough choice. Mm. A and B just seems equally bad. Well, maybe there's a C version, but you haven't seen it yet. Does that mean we have to expand ourselves past? Uh, does that mean we have to expand ourselves beyond our everyday self and awareness and I just say get yourself out of your own comfort zone Conf mm. expand your mind and leave your karma behind mm -hmm. okay you don't have to carry your karma too far mm -hmm. it's like coal on an old steam engine you put it into the furnace not into the passenger compartment if you put the coal into the furnace ie you become aware of your karma then in the light of your awareness, your karma burns. Mm -hmm. And it becomes energy, it becomes motivation, it becomes fuel for the next step until the next station. So don't worry about your karma, just put it to the right place and let it burn. Then Thank it's the right choice. Thank you. Last few questions. Thank you. Is there a direct correlation between suffering and karma? There is. Our karma causes suffering, and any suffering that appears is out of karma, cause and effect. Karma comes from the past, but it's not predetermined. To the extent of our ignorance, it seems to be determined. To the extent of our awakening, it seems to be a conscious choice. We cause suffering, we have it. If we don't cause suffering, we do not have it. So if you look at Shakyamuni's teaching, the first 10, 15 years, he just taught about the Four Noble Truths. That's it. Then came the Prajnaparamita scriptures. In your Heart Sutra, it's there that originally there is no suffering, no cause, no end, no way to end it. If it's created, it's there. If it's not created, it's not there. So that's how karma works. So the inexplainable suffering becomes explainable. Yes. That explanation is not enough. It's necessary, but it's not where it ends. If we see cause and effect clearly, 
then we can take away suffering. That's why correct explanation is necessary. But it's like the label on a gallon jar of some product, okay? The label is very small. The gallon itself, which contains the product, that's the majority. And the access towards changing cause and effect? That's in there. That's in your mind. No other access. Everything is mine. Everything is created by mind alone. That's true. And we are responsible for our own. When we, we put our minds together, then we have, let's say, a group decision. Mm -hmm. Then it's our group karma operating. If our minds are clear individually, this group karma is very high level. Minds are not clear, group karma very low level. If you reverse this and you see some very, very bad outcome of some group decision, you can bet that the minds participating in it are not clear at all. It's ridden with greed and anger and ignorance. So is conscious choice... Clarity, playing, then conscious choice. ...playing a big part in this whole thing then? I think that's the only part that it plays. There's nothing else that plays that big part, like clarity and conscious choice, being aware of cause and effect. Mm. My choice, what kind of result? Another choice, what kind of result? Sort of like a self-imposed operant behavior therapy. Instantly being aware I, of what's happening. Here I feel like happening. Winnie the Pooh, you know, that doesn't understand this term, but I understand oatmeal for breakfast. Yeah. So. Well, it's sort of like, ouch, immediately. Yeah, I understand that too. Thank you. Thank you. So if we can be less, remove the dualism, you know, not keeping our mind to be more non-dualism, that way the suffering will be much less. Right. You cannot remove dualism, but you can transcend it. Transcend Remember it. the aircraft metaphor? Correct. You don't blow up your shuttle bus. You ride an aircraft by getting off the shuttle bus. <laughs> okay. okay, okay. All right, so that's good. Um, question regarding the, um, if we, you talk about we, are, we eventually all Buddha, right? We are all Buddha right now. The only reason some of them are we are not practicing, not realize we are Buddha, right? And then when you give example of a 360 degree... Potentially we are Buddhas. If we, we were all really Buddhas, the world wouldn't look like this. Okay, so we are, right now we are... Potentially we are Buddhas, but we are attached to our karma because that's the only thing we have seen. If we see more, if we can transcend the, our karma, we won't become attached to it. It will not be so pleasant. Okay. Addicts can tell you that. Once they have seen their addict karma, and they had a chance to go beyond it, and they didn't relapse, they don't go back to those habits. They don't want to. In this life, we, all humans, are addicted to this. So how do we wake up from the usual, socially acceptable habits of anger, greed, and ignorance? It's not only accepted, sometimes it's even encouraged. That's the problem. How do we wake up from that? Um, stop mind activity. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So it does, is that true also when you stop mind activity, you actually stop your new karma creation? Yeah, and you cut off the energy supply to the old one. In Asia, it's called Wu Wei in Chinese. Complete non-action. Complete yeah. not moving mind, including creative or reactive. This not moving mind is our treasure because we have that. That's our potential to wake up because we can come back to this point. When you hear the sound for one moment, your thinking is cut off. That moment is our treasure. But how long we can maintain that? As long as you want. No, I don't think so. <laughs> when your habits kick in, you lose it for some time. That's why we practice that this loss of clarity would be reduced to less less, less, then it can disappear. Can we working also maintain the same kind of non-activity? Yes. This is a symbolic gesture. I mean, can you imagine that the Zen practitioner would do this 24 hours a day? It's a different institution. It's a mental hospital. <laughs> so how do you maintain this clarity without hitting with the stick? That's why we meditate, to have that internally, okay? That's our job. More questions? Yeah, we all thing. carry our karma backpack. Yes, we do. It keeps us warm and under pressure. We love that. <laughs>
And we're all free to burn that backpack. Yes, we do. But better put it into the engine of your vehicle and not just blow it up on the roadside. And that's why we need to use our fuel very wisely. It's a $3.99 a gallon. It's expensive. So practice and correct lifestyle means that you put your karma into your engine. And then it becomes the fuel for your vehicle. And it turns out that your karma is actually not so bad because it's an energy resource. Put the backpack right before you and see the content. Most of it is unnecessary. Most of it can become energy right away, potential right away. So unpack your backpack, lay it all out in front of you. Yeah, first have that clarity. Kind of undo the backpack because it's kind of bolted or fixed on us so much we identify with it. We don't believe that this backpack is separate from us. So the first order of the day when you practice, that you see the straps, you see all these kind of contraption here, and then you take it off. And that's when you start to see what's in your mind. Because you have no more self-defense, no more attachment, no more ideas about yourself. Then this backpack can actually come off your back, which you never thought would be possible. And then you look into it. Hmm. Resentment, anger, burn. Perfection, idealism, burn. All these ideas that we carry and we want to realize, they take up energy. Mostly, these things cannot be realized. So come back to reality by burning these ideas in the light of your awareness. Then it becomes part of our ecosystem. So there's nothing wrong with manure. Just put it to the garden and not onto the kitchen table. There's nothing wrong with karma. Put that to your awareness engine of the mind. And it becomes motivation instead of being a hindrance. That's how we work. We have no other resource. And that comes from clarity. And Nothing that clarity else. brings that skillful means to use that karma exactly. appropriately. Clarity at this moment, without any intellectual construct, just seeing. The Buddha called this vidya. That's where videre and video and everything, television comes from. It's seeing, rather than thinking about it. It turns out that if we have this conceptual thinking in an overdrive, it spots our mind mirrored, and this clarity is gone because we are loaded with ideas. And then ignorance hits because this mirror can become very thin, very fragile. It can break because we think too much, we feel too much, and we can't stop. And when we stop, we return to don't know, no thinking, not making, not wanting, not attaching. Then this mirror becomes very strong and very clear because you don't waste it. And then we have real choices. Then our mind is clear. Then this moment is clear. There is no other clarity than at this moment. And this moment is the only thing that can become truly clear. Vice versa. So videre is seeing, perceiving, and avidya is not seeing. That's ignorance. That was the first translation of avidya as ignorance. But I prefer not seeing or clouded mind or unclear mind because ignorance suggests that some information is missing. You haven't read the right book. It's small ignorance. It's possible to term it that way. But big ignorance is actually when the mind is clouded from its own ideas, from its own dualistic making or creations. Okay? Yeah. The clarity of the moment is the only clarity you can have. Exactly. There is no clarity outside of this moment, and only at this moment you can attain clarity. And the lack of clarity, or the disturbance of clarity, comes from inside? Both, inside and outside. But it's your mind that is perpetuating it, or reacting to it, in one way or another. The moment you react to something, you give energy to it positive or negative. That's how you fuel it. Negative feedback also supports the phenomenon. Positive feedback also supports the phenomenon. No reaction takes the energy out of it. it also takes the information out of it because you don't think about it. You don't have any feelings about it. You don't talk about it and you don't do anything based on that. You empty out these four channels, soon it's gone. 
Could you say them again, <laughs> the four channels? Action, Action. speech, feelings, mm -hmm. thoughts. They are so important that in our chanting, we have four bodhisattvas that are responsible for this. Action is Deheng Boyon Bosal in Korean, Samantabhadra in Sanskrit. Speech, Kshiti Garba or Jijang Bosal in Korean. Feelings, best form is compassion, Kwan Sam Bosal, Kwan Sam Bosatsu, okay, or Avalokiteshvara. And thinking, best form, wisdom, is Manjushri or Munsu Bosal. So every day when we bow to them, these powers that we have and others have, we externalize these qualities, clean them up, and then internalize them again. That's why Mahayana has very many skillful means. Project and introject. Externalize, internalize. Clean it up, use it again. It's wonderful. So these channels are our major avenues to interact with the world, including, of course, or in addition to, our physical senses. You control these four channels, you control your life. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I sincerely want to thank you for receiving me here today, to have your wonderful questions. It was an honor to answer, and I hope that in the future we can meet again, practice the Dharma again, and make another sincere effort to attain enlightenment and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.